I'm also presenting the work, my work of the last few years, and uh, been all consuming. Um, and uh, I've been I've been working on a project. I'm interested in age and popular music, and I've been working on. And, 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 and <laughs> I think it pretty much started when I was first turned away from a nightclub ever, and uh, that led to a major crisis because I thought I can no longer be clubbing. And so um, I thought, okay, I want to look into this. But how you know all the kind of unwritten rules about age and people going clubbing and what you have to do and can do and can't do, and uh, it led. Um, it led to actually a fairly big project that um, I was lucky enough to be funded for. Um, and um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the project and then the hypothesis that I had about clubbing and particular waves in this context. And I will present some findings and talk a little bit about the implications and the questions that are arising for me now from this project where I would like to take it next. Um, so. The project that I'm referring to is the Let's Clever project. Um, and um, it's been pretty amazing. We, we, um, we got funded from the Heritage Lottery Fund, which will tell you something about the project. So the uh, HLF considered it important enough and already to be heritage. Um, and we are based in Manchester, so we started looking at the kind of nightclub culture in and around Manchester. And we limited it at the beginning to 1985 to 1995, purely because we didn't know where it would be going. Um, and luckily, this particular fund is very, I can only recommend HLF, it's very flexible. So you can propose new avenues if they, if, if they come about. Um, and this project was a project um, through co-production, which uh, helped me learn a lot about taking a step back and have other people decide what we're going to do next. And uh, we developed the, uh, the Labs Clever Audio Map. Um, and just to quickly show you, um, it's basically a map, it's based on Google Maps, and people could uh, pin, they could drop a pin for a location of a nightclub in Manchester. And if you were to click on, I don't know, any random pin, you, people are still able, it's an open project, to, to leave memories and you can visit this, this map and listen to the memories of, uh, of other people. And uh, I, I argued when I started this project that um, somehow wave culture, I've got a bit more bonnet about this culture being always represented as purely hedonistic, apolitical, absolutely useless, people just being off their heads. Um, and I thought, I, I can, I've tried this before as an academic, I can write about it however much I want, I, I'm somehow not being heard. And I thought this project might, might give people an opportunity to be heard more than, more, than I can, more than I can say. So, that's just about the project. Um, as part of this, we did an online survey and we conducted 50 interviews, and out of those, out of those, the online survey interviews and partly the memories that were put on the map, um, themes occurred. And one of the themes that I'm talking about today is the journey to a rave. Um, people started bringing up that were open ended questions in the interviews, and um, people started to make distinctions between a drive and a journey. So, there, I'd say about half of the interviewees talked about the drive as the importance of being the, the final destination and the arrival of it and then something starts versus the journey where um, the beginning of the drive is actually also the beginning of the experience and it then leads on to, to a much bigger experience. And whenever they talked about drives to waves, they started using the term journey because it wasn't, it wasn't actually means to an end, it presented more and um, the, uh, the aspects that we started focusing on when we, when we went through the interviews is um, the duration, people that the ravers went with, the music and the drugs and the landscape. So to just quickly go through these points, um, the, um, it's quite hard for me to imagine, <laughs> I'm younger, but uh, so this is pre-mobile phone and pre-satnav or GPS. So, 
these journeys could last for hours on end, and sometimes you wouldn't find a way and had to turn back, or you just had to listen to the music and try to find it, or the police would stop you. Um, not a single person, or every person who we interviewed said they would never get in a car with a driver they didn't know. So there was already some sort of community um, established before people got in the car. It, it, it had to be at least a friend of a friend that they had heard of. Um, and of course all the practices related to rave, rave culture started already in the car. Um, people also commented quite strongly on the change of the landscape and what that meant for, for the journey. So, um, people who we interviewed based on Greater Manchester, they would start off in the city, and then as they were driving, um, leaving the city to a rural landscape, what that change of landscape meant to them. Um, this is uh, Josh McKay, um, the only quote I'm going to give you. One central way in which cultures of resistance define themselves against the culture of the majority is through the construction of their own zones, their own spaces. These can be distinguished in part through the subcultural elements of music, style of favorite drugs, I mean, they, they usually are, um, but space itself is vital. Right and we decided um, for part of the project to focus on space. And in here, space refers to more than the site of the rave. So it's not just the location, it's also got to do with the sort of mental space that, that um, ravers create for themselves, they don't just engage in it, they create it for themselves as they start the journey. So the, um, the first part, for me the most interesting one was the getting ready part. So getting dressed, you could imagine that this is part of the getting ready ritual. Um, people um, talked about the fact that in nightclubs at the time you usually had to wear a tie and a shirt as a man, and it wasn't uncommon for women to wear high heels. When they went to a rave, it was more about comfy food and the jumper, keeping warm. Um, what, what I had anticipated is the ritual of picking up other passengers. That really meant a phase of transition, and partly because you, people wouldn't just wait for you and then you could pick them up and you would continue the drive. You would, you would start at 7 o'clock in the evening, drive to the first person and stay there for a couple of hours and do whatever you wanted to do. And then the two of you went to the next person and stayed there. Maybe picked up some gear, some DJ equipment on the way, and then you would pick up the next person. So occasionally people would not leave the city before one o'clock in the morning and have spent hours with fellow ravers in their houses, not necessarily public places, usually pri private places. Um, and I, I term this fine tuning. So it's, it's about where you pick somebody up physically as well as mentally and to, to kind of prepare for the journey and, and kind of find out how other people, what mood other people are in and if it's possible to actually get in a car, a very small car together for hours on end. Um, and of course the other point that is interesting here is the meeting on the way. So service stations were always mentioned, um, the Manchester Ring Road, for those of you who don't know it, motorway like the Rock London, and there were crucial service stations where Without having talked about it, cars would always meet, identify other ravers, and then kind of search together for the rave. And so we are talking here already about hours before people actually set off and find the rave. Um, and these hours are, are interesting in that they give people an opportunity to, to form a community. And I didn't, I didn't realize how important that was until I interviewed younger ravers and clubbers who make, make their ways to the events themselves and then they meet up with other people and they stay together in groups in the nightclub. So we now have a kind of social construct that exists inside the nightclub where people kind of singularly um, move towards the nightclub. And then in, in, in terms of the rave, um, people would be together before and form the space, but once they actually arrived at a rave, they would spread out. So this is when they said we want to meet other people, we want to talk to other people, we want to dance with other people. They met lots of people, had lots of new experiences, influences, conversations, and the car, as well as the people who they joined, uh, who they drove with, 
started to provide the base, the safe base for them whilst they were at the journey. So there's a clear difference between um, any club cut or even raves that are happening again today and what it was like 30 years ago. The, um, the, the car in particular also had the function of being an alternative venue to the rave. So for people who needed to retreat, who wanted to talk, who wanted quiet, but also wanted different kind of music through the uh, cassette player, uh, would do that in the car or the van, or if they wanted to sleep, whatever they wanted to do, so they could they could move easily between those two venues in a way, the big rave site that of course is open space and doesn't really have any any borders, and the car is a kind of closed and confined space. Um, the the return journey is also of course a very return home. So I think we only had two people who said I usually went home because I had to work on Monday. Our usual response was, and I have to say those interviews were self-selected, that they carried on going some ways because they didn't want it to end. Um, so it's coming down together, but it's also to go to other sites of limited experience. So the sunrise, um, going back into the city, city by the motorway. Um, so experiences that they don't have every day. And then they would slowly, as they got tired, make their ways make their ways home individually. So the driver wouldn't necessarily drop the people off again where the driver met them. Um, and the argument that I'd like to present is that um, we're looking here at, of, um, we're looking here at a, at a different understanding of home. Um, the the labs clubs who we interviewed are between 45 and 65, and what was striking to me in the interviews. Um, is that they, um, they started talking about home in a very distinct way that they hadn't experienced before. And the way they talked about home had nothing to do with geography. It was purely based on people and a particular feel or a particular mood. Um, the plural ethos, for those of you who, not, um, who don't know it, is um, peace, love, unity and respect. And not everybody referred to it explicitly, but they always talked about kind of respect for each other and, um, and that everything is, is, is non-aggressive, people are very peacefully together, and they form a community. Um, the word that came most up in the interviews when we did the corpus analysis was family. And they didn't, I think we had one interview we who went with his brother. So we're not talking about the, the kind of blood family, but we're talking about the community that for those for those people represents a very strong bond. Um, and linking this back to um, cultures of resistance, so the, the main argument that I'm usually confronted with is that rave culture has had no implications on ravers apart from going to a party. But what we find here is that at least this particular generation of ravers has a strong sense of being a resistant culture. This is partly because they resisted work life. You could argue the same about other cultures. I'm not saying this is a, a unique situation. Um, also day and night, weekdays and weekends, the schedule of it, suspense of time. But on top of this, there was definitely a, a, an undercurrent of we can change things together. So we are starting a movement, we have no idea where this is going, we're not articulating it, but by being together at the rave, something else is going to change. I mean, this is on the backdrop of, of um, um, you say me? Um, Thatcherism and a strong promotion of um, private entrepreneurship, which of course happens in rave culture. Um, but our interviews you know, refer to a particular time in which it's more important to be together with other people who they didn't know than it was to make money out of this culture. Um, so the questions that are arising from this, um, the Art and Herman wrote an interesting article in which they talk about the transgressive potential of, of early wave culture. So changing the wave sensibility from countercultural resistance what is commodification resulted in a loss of transgressive potential. They are arguing, in other words, that with the com commercialization of rave culture, all of this potential disappears. I don't really disagree, and I don't really agree, but what we, what we have to be very clear about at the moment, there's a, there's a revival of the term rave, but what's being meant by rave is something completely different. 
So when I talk to 18 to 20 year olds about a rave, this is something highly commercially organized, usually in a nightclub. Um, it's got a start time and an end time. Time you purchase the ticket, it's a nightclub license, you know, the usual things. Um, but I would argue the reason why the term rave is being used is because it refers to a particular sens sensibility that that is fair to have disappeared, and especially young ravers, and in Manchester we always have the reference to the Hacienda, with the lows and the images and the colours, they, they are they're seeking those experiences. Um, also, since, since the licensing laws have changed, um, of course nightclubs are no longer the only places where we can consume alcohol. So at some point it used to be the case that, you know, at two o'clock in the morning it would be the only place, but now it can be a, a bar, a pub, whatever it is. Um, so in terms of the leisure industry, it's become much harder for nightclubs to sustain themselves. So we have branding, we have sponsorship, so it, it, it's, it's become hyper-commercial in a way. Um, and what I would like to propose is that looking at festivals as sites of transgressive potential, here we have something that is worth looking at in terms of forming a temporary community people traveling together. I mean, we've interviewed people who fly together every year. So they start off in Manchester, they get on a plane, then on a coach, then on a shuttle bus to get to the site of the festival. And there they have similar experiences to, to people who went to raves. So I'm not saying it's disappeared, this transgressive potential. It's, it's definitely changed in some ways. Um, but I, I would say it's there. It's still there. We just, it's, for me, it's now interesting to look at festival as those opportunities for young people to engage with other young people and what they take away from those festivals. For a while, I thought festival is kind of subject to the same criticism that they don't really do anything for the people who go. So people go to festivals and then they come back and nothing really changes. But what's coming out of, of kind of recent interviews is that that's not the case. They're starting to go regularly to these festivals. They have a, they have a friend base that continues to go to these festivals. And they, they make friends around that particular culture. So, in conclusion, the journey is or was important for, for these ravers to form a community and to feel strong enough to then, once they get to a rave, kind of branch out and make new experiences. Um, and this, I, I don't think this has disappeared. I think it's part of human nature. It's just a question of how, what we define as journeys today. And how we investigate journeys to particular sites and not to ignore them. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got a few minutes to spare, so we've got time for, for a few questions. Uh, yeah, go for it. Um, the transgressive potential of writing, right? Mm -hmm. So you interview people who were uh, who, who, who were involved in the eighties and nineties. So I just wondered, was there any reflection on about how that changed their lives in the present day. I'm thinking of Pete Webster's studies with punks mm. and the way that they integrate those kind of mm. discourses of, uh, of punk rock and DIY into their daily lives, yeah. whether they're a potter or a photographer or, or, yeah. larger, or a nurse or whatever. I'm um, just wondering if that, that profound effect that was clearly going on there, that they carried them with that into the people they are now in terms of sense of identity. Mm. It, it has, um, and it's quite interesting. It's partly the results of the interviews, and we haven't finished the analysis. Um, one of the things that has come through when, when, um, when we did our online survey, the majority of professions was in the creative industries. And out of those creative industries, the majority of professions were linked in some way to music culture. So they become photographers of nightclubs or events, they become producers, they made, you know, kind of not very big businesses necessarily, but there was a strong link. There's also lots of interviewees. Um, refer to the values that they're teaching their children. So in the online survey, we had a big section of children and how liberal you treat that, you know, you use the information about yourself and when you might tell your children about your, about your past. And there were many people who said, we've graded this according to the age of the children, but I want my children to know that I took drugs. We were surprised by that. But people are very honest and, and, and said, you know, I still have this attitude towards alcohol and all sorts of other drugs. And of course, it's interesting because if I, if I look at um, working together with a criminologist at the moment, and she is saying, 
it's all good and well to do that research in nightclubs, but when people, once people start taking domestically drugs, then it becomes much harder for us to, to see what's going on. But many people continue. So my hypothesis was, they set it down, they have kids, it's over. And that's not happened at all. They all continue, they still go out, even if, I mean, if, you know, traditionally the model still exists that um, men grow up more often than women. This is um, predominantly defined by parenthood. Um, but that women in particular have an issue with uh, being molded back into the model of a, of a kind of traditional woman. So that in particular, women refer to the rape side as being a liberating side where they were treated equals. And they now refer to a lot of quarreling at home because they're resisting, resisting that kind of motherhood role that they have to take. Um, but uh, oh, I forgot my last point. <laughs> but yes, it, it has. It, it, they continue to um, to celebrate certain values. Oh yeah, the other point was 82% um, were self-employed. Um, and of course, the argument in rape culture always was that allows you to work at certain times and not at other times. We were surprised by that number as well. Um, so I'm, I'm still awaiting <laughs> the final results, but yes, absolutely. Um, it's all illegal though, right? Isn't it? Which is part of its, part of its fizz, isn't it? It's, it wasn't it's always a, illegal. So the reason why we focused on 85 to 95 is because it only really became criminalized right. in 1994 with the Rafe Bill. Before that, yes, and we have a, you know, there's going on a bit of a mixture of subcultures. So we have travelers who would actually be on land that is not their own, but the farmer would very often um, um, be okay with them staying on the land for as long as they left the land like it was before. So raves, when they started off, weren't illegal and that you know yeah. you were penalized for doing it. Yeah. That only kicked in in 1994 and the people we interviewed kind of referred to that difference before 1994 and after 1994. So then yes, they became yeah. illegal yeah. and this is also partly when then there was a real push towards the commercialization of rapes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm. yeah the pencil, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> In a way, in terms of these themes, and particularly I was struck by the amount of commitment and effort that goes in in the memories there, you know, mm. weekends, amount of uh, effort and journey, sometimes with no return. And in tandem with the, 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 the mapping, did you get a sense of the economy of raids? Because this is the pre and also, I was going to say illegal, but the informal economy of central trade. So, do you get any sense of how that works, the, the frequency of going to raise for many of the people, mm. the cost, the yeah. duration mm. of raves. Um, <clears throat> we did it in the online service, we did the kind of back then and today comparison of frequency, for example. And the mo I can't remember the percentage now, but the most um, popular option that was ticked was that people went on a rave several days a week for several days in a row. So it's not only three times a week, but also maybe starting off on Friday, lasting to Sunday or Monday. That was the most popular option of all, from all respondents. Um, and there, um, there seems to be a clear distinction between people who are very political about this and they say, you know, the free party scene has not disappeared and we only do it for the good of the people and we want people to come together and celebrate and they continue not to ask for money. Um, but then, of course, there's another commercial aspect of it where people said, you know, it's like a typical argument. We had to grow up at some point, I had to earn money, I decided to do it through rave culture or music or whatever related industry developed rather than a nine to five kind of office job. Um, I don't, I don't have an insight into the commercial side of raves and then organized or legal mm -hmm. raves, which of course can only be said, but, um, um, but the free party scene, we have people who sat within Manchester, there are 300, roughly 300 people who travel to these sites at the weekend, they all know each other, different cars, different constellations, but a fairly fixed group of people who would go there. 
Uh, considering that the kind of music that was being played at this time was quite novel, yeah. did you, uh, in your research, investigate if people who are still going are trying to listen to the kind of music that was played back then, or are they still searching for something new musically speaking? This will also depends on how, people, how often people go out today. So, um, where people just said, because you couldn't hear the music anywhere else, you would have to go to the race to actually hear the music. There were, however, also people who said, we didn't care about the music, we just wanted to go to these events. Uh, the people who've become professionally involved with aspects of that industry are the people who are still seeking out new music. Um, but we've interviewed quite a few um, disenfranchised DJs who said there's nothing new in electronic music. Um, so they've gone back to funk, soul, reggae, you know, it's, they're not as engaged with this particular aspect of electronic music anymore. They are still engaged. And there are hilarious stories on the map about DJ Beth being packed in record stores and all of this. But, um, so again, it's a split, and it's interesting to see. I mean, you know, we are not talking about a homogenous youth culture if that even exists. Um, but it's interesting to see where the split is happening. Is it is it happening, you know, along this kind of demarcation line of values that have to do with money or commercialization, or are the demarcation lines somewhere else? We don't know yet. Ongoing. <laughs> Yeah, Justin, last one. Yeah. Uh, you spoke about factorism and resistance. I wonder what you thought about Simon Reynolds' argument that really culture helped to actually perpetuate factorism because it gave people the illusion of resistance, but also made life better than that under factorism that they didn't actually get involved in it if we are actually resisting in a meaningful way. I think it's a chicken and egg situation. So there would have been people who really felt empowered and thinking they're resisting. Um, the values that were promoted by conservative government at the time, but at the same time, and, and I think literature is fairly split in the middle, you have people who say, you know, we make money from it. There's a, there's a lovely article that talks about the kind of cross-fertilization of this kind of fetuist idea of private entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and being a social enterprise and having some sort of responsibility, but also making money if you're good at it. And this is starting in wave culture. So the kind of hyper-commercial part is not towards kind of mid-90s, but you have people who say, we can't keep on doing this for free, so we're asking for donations. Actually, we are starting to ask for... So, so yes, it's not as radical as Reynolds presents it, mm -hmm. but, but he has a point as well. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.